In this lecture, we're looking at the 17th century as a whole, pulling the lens back and trying to get a sense of all the complexity that goes on here in this century, so that when we dive into specifics for this century, we can have a real grasp of what's going on all around Europe and into the New World. And really, the reason for this lecture is because too often we tend to compartmentalize things that need to be kept together. We have maybe a sweep of the history in our mind, how we go from one generation of things to the next. We also have another compartment in our mind at times as to great names, great figures, great movements, but we don't always put these together. In my case, the first time I realized this was when I was a new student to the subject of history. I had in my mind two separate categories of the Reformation and the Renaissance. This was how I was taught it. When we were discussing the Renaissance, it was Art, Michelangelo, Da Vinci, Donatello, and so on. And it was this wonderful flowering of the arts and of letters. In another space in my mind, you might say, I had the Reformation, Luther, Calvin, and others. And then one day I sat down and I started to sketch out a timeline of all the things that are happening in and around the Reformation. And it was, frankly, eye-opening to realize that Michelangelo in particular, just to take one case, actually lived and painted well beyond the Reformation, which means that he was there painting and sculpting and doing all these things while Luther was up in Germany founding a Reformation movement. And just taking that as a microcosm of the problem here, when we look at the 17th century, we don't always appreciate the fact that there is so much upheaval, so much change, both in terms of culture and politics and the landscape of the world, but also in terms of the intellectual world, biblical studies, and theology. Just to put it bluntly, the 17th century begins with Elizabeth I in the Shakespearean age, and it ends with the Salem witch trials. Elizabeth dies in 1603, and the Salem witch trials are in the 1690s. Now, for most of us, those two worlds are significantly apart. We don't see them as part of a continuum. We don't notice all of the complexities that lead from one to the next. So in this lecture, we're going to be looking at the big picture. What happens all throughout Europe, and what are some of the names and the events and the turning points that historians always find so interesting and complex? Well, we can begin with some of the good things that are invented or discovered here in the 17th century. Two of the most important, ice cream and coffee. <laughs> You see a real flowering of trade, meaning things from one part of Europe or one part of the world, and therefore the inventions or the discoveries from one part of the world, begin to really intermesh with other cultures. Part of this is revolutions in technology related to travel. Part of this is the fact that the new world really expands and mingles together all kinds of cultures from Europe as a whole. But if you just think about the eastern coast, the colonies, and then you think about the countries that land there, thereby putting culture after culture side by side. You begin to get a sense of this. Scottish and English folks will land in certain parts of New England and suddenly be living right alongside German folks, Scandinavian folks, all kinds of things. And so the 17th century, in a manner of speaking, is a real flowering of trade, engagement, and invention. It's during the 17th century, for example, that Kepler and Galileo and a number of figures who will revolutionize the way we see the heavens began to do their writing and at times come into controversy with the Catholic Church, Galileo in particular. As you carry forward, though, into the later part of the 17th century, 1687, Isaac Newton, the man whose theory of gravitation, amongst other things, came to define centuries of how the scientific world engaged with the physical surrounding world around them. Now, the history of science, of course, is always told as if it immediately was opposed to the church and to theology. The story of Galileo is often a case in point. He is put on trial and he is under fire for his scientific discoveries related to the solar system. But what's going on here is not yet overtly hostile to either theology, whether it be Catholic or Protestant. Just take Isaac Newton, for example, one of the more recent things that has been argued and pointed out is that Isaac Newton, believe it or not, wrote more pages on subjects related to theology in the Bible than he actually did on science. 
You know, he has some strange views here and there. He challenges some of the understanding of the Trinity and so on. I would say he was a good theologian. But the traditional idea is that it's in the 17th century that it all goes downhill really fast. Suddenly the church is on the fringe and this quote-unquote scientific revolution elbows out faith. Well, that's on the horizon, but it's not in play yet. The 17th century is something of the high watermark, just as we saw with trade and other types of things related to food and beverage, where you see science and theology and all kinds of these things mingling and co-mingling and coming together. In theology and philosophy, you have an equal amount of flowering and interaction. In the world of theology, you have the rise of what we call the confessional age, as well as scholasticism, Protestant scholasticism to be specific. The confessional age is an age in which just about every denomination at some point, or every branch of the Protestant faith, is beginning to really come down and to crystallize its confessional views on things. So in the Reformed world, you see things like the Senate of Dort, which fought against Arminianism, and we're going to look at that in greater detail later. You also see the rise of the Westminster Confession during the English Civil War, by far the most extensive and elaborate confession from the Reformed world. But there are others. All of this is shaped, though, by a real heady mixture of scholasticism with Protestant theology. Now, we said when we were looking at Luther that not everyone who is scholastic is by default theologically suspect. Scholasticism is more of a method. It's more like a robust version of systematic theology. Well, this begins to really flower here. Now, a lot of the names that are associated with either Lutheran scholasticism or Reformed scholasticism, etc., are not names that we know a great deal of. But one of the things that begins to happen to Protestant theology is it begins to move from a more humanist base of education to, again, this scholastic base. There has been a lot of fighting and infighting, depending on the denomination or the historian involved, as to whether or not this is a good thing or a bad thing. So take the one issue we've looked at once or twice, the dreaded question of Calvin and Calvinism. Well, as scholasticism unfolds and as it begins to develop, you see Reformed folks discussing things in a new way and with a new depth and with a new focus on clarity and scholastic rigor to a point that Calvin as a humanist is not always willing to go. Now, the question is always, okay, different methodology. It's going to feel different. It's going to sound different. But is it different theology? And we're going to look at some of this as we go through. So the Synod of Dort discussing something that we would later call limited atonement. Well, Calvin himself doesn't really discuss this, or if he even mentions something anywhere close to this idea, he is unwilling to discuss it. He, being a humanist, is more linguistic, historical, grammatical. Scholastics, though, will delve a bit deeper into certain theological areas. In the realm of philosophy, you do see a tussle, a back and forth, between those who are attempting to ground Christian philosophy on a firm base and those who strike out for new ground. In the country of France, you have the person of Descartes. Descartes was the man who argued, I think, therefore I am, which is one of the more overwrought and underappreciated slogans in all of the history of philosophy. Descartes essentially wants to find a grounding or a rationale for confidence in our ability to rationalize or reason our way to certain topics. In many ways, he's very much like a late medieval theologian or philosopher, something like Aquinas. All these thinkers in the Middle Ages are debating the limits of faith and reason. Descartes is really in this category, but where Descartes goes is not towards the scriptures, not towards the Bible as either the sole foundation for our intellectual understanding of God and truth, nor does he see it as part of the equation per se. The slogan, I think, therefore I am, in other words, becomes a real individualistic appreciation that because I can be confident that if I'm thinking, I'm not being made to think, therefore the fact that I am thinking things itself is a given, doesn't have to be proven. And from that, he builds up a case of what we today call epistemology, which is how do we know anything? Descartes' answer is, I know because... I am knowing, and if I am knowing something, the very fact that I know anything means that I'm thinking it. Therefore, because I'm thinking, I must exist. 
Now, again, this is one of those great moments in philosophy, particularly for new students, where they get a little bit of brain cramp going on trying to figure out why he is arguing this. And we're not going to go into this now, but what we're seeing happen here is a development within the areas of philosophy that are going to begin moving step by step towards Enlightenment philosophy, increasingly away from traditional foundations of the church or the Bible, and increasingly in favor of rational thought and philosophy as the foundation of where they're going. Okay, so that's philosophy and theology. What about the arts? What about music? What about discoveries? What about all these wonderful things? Well, the 17th century is the age that we call the Baroque period. And Baroque, if you want a simple definition, it's just a form of the arts that is elaborate or exaggerated. So Baroque architecture is the kind of architecture that is almost gaudy at times. It's so overwrought and there's so many intricacies going on. Baroque music, people like Bach and Vivaldi and Pachelbel. Baroque music is, again, very ornate, elaborate, has a certain affection to it. In its worst form, it's affected and saccharine, kind of boring. At its best, it has twists and turns in the music or in the art that you just simply can't escape from. In the fine arts, you see the rise of one of my favorite painters, Vermeer. If you just hold up Vermeer's paintings, they are at times nearly mirror sharp. The complexity of it, the detail of it. Now, we're pretty certain in the modern world that what Vermeer is using is some type of technology to be able to do this. There's some type of mirror system, some type of perspective system that allows him to get this just right. But if you hold up Vermeer to something that was going on in the early 16th century, there is this unmistakable sense that you have this massive leap forward in terms of color, precision, and this real complex, again, Baroque, complex understanding of the arts. So when you look at the 17th century in terms of culture, in terms of thinking, writing, and expression, and these kinds of things, you have to understand that much of what's going on here is a flowering of the engagement of multiple cultures, multiple movements, and multiple styles that are more maximalist in the Baroque sense than they are minimalist or reactionary. Now, what does this have to do with theology and church history? Well, one of the things that's often pointed out is that because of the tendency amongst Protestants, particularly amongst Reformed folks and some in the Anglican world, you see very often that the arts in particular and music are being supported principally by Catholics. As they are moving into the 17th century, they begin to realize that Protestants like more simple and plain style churches. And so the Catholic Church really steps up and begins to fund and support the arts in numerous elaborate ways just as they did, you might say, in the beginning of the Renaissance. The Baroque era, in other words, this flowering of all kinds of things, intellectual and artistic, in some ways is shaped by the Protestant Reformation. Protestants will respond, usually in the intellectual world. A number of the scientists, in fact, and philosophers and thinkers and writers from this period come from a relatively Protestant perspective. That's unfair, of course. There are leading intellectuals who are Catholic or perhaps no religion at all by the end. But no matter what, what you're seeing again is a real development. And often the 17th century is so elaborate and so complex. The style here is very affected. It's very in your face. Okay, but what about the politics? Well, the countries that are in play in Europe and in the New World are relatively familiar to us. From the 16th century, we will all remember the Holy Roman Empire, which is often referred to as Germany, though it doesn't quite compare to what would become modern Germany. But there's the Holy Roman Empire, run by the Habsburg dynasty, the great 16th century figure of Charles V, of course, had been the head of the Holy Roman Empire. Moving west, we get to France, still a powerhouse, in fact, throughout the 17th century, rising even further to be an equal, at least in their own eyes, and attempting to galvanize itself to be the main player in Europe. Up in Britain, you have, of course, England, which goes through some calamitous events in the 17th century. You have the move from the Tudor dynasty with Elizabeth I and the Shakespearean age into the tumultuous decades of the Stuart dynasty, with James I, King James, coming to the throne after Elizabeth and his son, Charles I, 
becoming the catalyst through the way that he ruled for the calamitous and the important English Civil War. Scotland had always been its own kingdom, though of course England from time to time attempted to subject it to its own authority. Well, during the 17th century, you see the coming together in the person of James, the Scottish crown and the English crown. And so Scotland and England, at one point, pretty intractable enemies become one nation, or at least a united front with two different cultures beneath. And then all around Europe as a whole, you have other kingdoms that play less of an important role in terms of religion or in terms of the ongoing effects of the Protestant Reformation, but they are important to note. Spain, at this point, really seeks to dominate and control a significant portion of Europe. A lot of its activity during this century is driven by the fact that they were amongst the first to go to the New World and to conquer, and they are constantly shipping back supplies and gold and trade from the New World, in particular South America and a few key areas in North America. Down in Italy, you still have a pretty divided subset patchwork of all these different regions. And of course, the big man on the block there is the Pope himself, controlling a majority of the central band of the Italian peninsula. So these are the names, these are the countries that are going to be in play all throughout the 17th century. To get a sense of what's going on here, though, all throughout the 16th century, the Habsburg dynasty and the Holy Roman Empire had really been the massive, important, and unrivaled champion of all the kingdoms there in Europe. France and England, of course, were major dynasties, but they couldn't compare on their own, nor could they rise up to be a challenge to the emperor himself. Throughout the 16th century, there were a number of times where different kingdoms, different countries banded together as a whole to attempt to take on the Holy Roman Empire, but these usually came to no avail. It's in the 17th century where we actually begin to see a decline in the Holy Roman Empire from its status as the unrivaled powerhouse in Europe. It doesn't go away, but what we're going to see throughout the 17th century, historians often call this a real calamitous century, particularly the first half. There are just so many wars going on, not only for religion, but also for a power grab. The first half of the century is marked by the Thirty Years' War, which is the most significant and bloody war, actually series of wars, that defined the end of the religious reformation in terms of trying to take each other out, you might say. 1648 often marks the end of the Thirty Years' War with the Great Treaty that eventually brought to an end the hostilities between Catholicism and Protestantism. But the shakeup of Europe as a result of all these wars is significant, and it actually affects not only the 17th century, but all subsequent history thereafter. So, for example, the context for the rise of Germany as a nation, which will happen in a later century, happens as a result of the fact that within the Holy Roman Empire itself, there are a number of folks who don't necessarily detach themselves fully from the empire, but as a result of the wars, they gain relative security and isolation from involvement or control from the emperor himself. So just take the Swiss regions. The Swiss cantons, by definition, were part of the Holy Roman Empire, but as a result of their resistance to the emperor, their independence becomes a more or less de facto position as we get into the 17th century. France begins to rise up in a way that it never could before, and it becomes really a powerhouse. And it always had been something of a powerhouse, but now it really comes into its own. More importantly, the Netherlands. The Netherlands had always been a united sort of strip of land there above the Holy Roman Empire. Well, they go into their own civil war. Philip II, the husband of Mary I back in the 16th century, Bloody Mary, had attempted to suppress Protestant impulses there. As the decades wore on, it turned into an outright civil war. And when we get to the Council of Dort and some of the other things that are going on within the 17th century, we're going to see the Netherlands begins to split in half, which is why to this day you have Netherlands to the north, which is Protestant historically, and to the south you have Belgium, which is predominantly Catholic over the years. This split allows the northern part of the Netherlands, which retains the name of the Netherlands, to really foster a golden age. In fact, people often marvel at how fast the Netherlands 
being such a small plot of land in the context of the wider space of Europe, is able to become, in some ways, the epicenter economically for all of Europe. It's a golden age there in terms of the arts. I've already mentioned Vermeer and other painters and artists and things there in the Netherlands. But there was also founded the Dutch Trading Company, one of the most important groups to really capitalize on the expansion and the widespread abilities of ships to bring trade to and from Europe. And so the Netherlands becomes a Protestant powerhouse economically. And lastly, when we turn our attention to England itself, we've already mentioned England in the Civil War, but England in particular starts to become involved and interested in the New World. It's in 1607, for example, that the city of Jamestown is founded, named actually for King James himself, the king there who took over after Elizabeth. It's in 1620, just a few years later, that the Mayflower takes off. And what's happening here is there's all kinds of fights and tussles within England and within the Anglican Church that are from the context of the English Civil War, but that give us so much of the world that we have some knowledge of and some experience of. It's in this century where the King of England begins to crack down on those who are not conforming to the English Church. And so men like John Bunyan get thrown into prison because they feel the need to meet and have their own church and not be part of the English Church. You see John Milton writing, Paradise Lost. John Owens, one of the most important theologians of the entirety of the 17th century, is writing here in the midst of all this chaos of the English Civil War and the fight back and forth as to what it means to be Anglican. And so the Puritan movement really gets going here in the 17th century. And as a result, as it transitions over to the New World, you have founded a transplant of this Puritan ethos flowing out of the 16th century into the 17th century that begins to shape the context theologically and in terms of church life for what would become the American colonies. So in the end, the 17th century, if you want just a real simple definition of what happens here, it's a time of upheaval, change, and renewal, both in the arts and in the political arena, as well as in the church. And so as we go through the lectures about the 17th century, always keep in mind that where you see these hot-blooded fights back and forth between groups that today might very well get along or just agree to disagree, keep in mind that this is the first sort of spasm of groups of people saying that they don't want to be part of the wider society, that they want to voluntarily separate themselves, whether it's in the church life or at times politically. Different nations saying, we don't want to be a part of this collective empire or something like this. The upheaval, in other words, the change, the rapid change, as well as the wars in the 17th century, mean that this is one of the more important centuries for transitioning Europe and the New World out of the late medieval and early modern period and increasingly towards the modern world. Mm -hmm.